All right. Well, welcome everyone. If you are just joining us, we'll ask that you go ahead and pop your name and where you're joining us from into the chat box. Um, welcome to our compostable guidelines launch. And um, I know this has been a much anticipated webinar for many of you. Um, and a huge congratulations to the AFCO team and everyone over at AORA and ABA that have helped to support this moving forward as well. So um, we'll just go ahead and run through the agenda. So my name is Meredith Up. I'm the Industry Partnership Manager here at APCO. Um, and I have the lucky job of being able to support the team that have been working through these guidelines. And I know for a lot of our members that compostability, um, there's a lot of questions around this. So I think we're all really excited to see the launch of these. So our agenda today will be the launch of the considerations for compostable plastic packaging. That'll come from our lovely Chief Executive Officer, Brooke Donnelly. Then we're going to hear from Rowan Williams. So Rowan is um, working over at the Australian Bioplastics Association um, and knows all things about bioplastics. Then we're going to hear from Peter Wodowitz, who works at Australian Organics Recycling Association, or AORA, um, so the Organics Recycling Association and um, all things compost is Pete's expertise. Then we're going to hand over to the lovely Lily Barnett. Um, Lily is the program manager here at APCO. and has been leading a lot of the work around these compostable guidelines. And she's going to give us a live demonstration on how to actually use these guidelines in real life. And then we'll have about 20 minutes or so for questions and answers after that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce everyone to Brooke Donnelly, the APCO CEO, to give us a little bit of a frame up for these guidelines in our session today. Brooke? Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you all online. I see we're at 330, my goodness me. Wow, um, it's so wonderful to have you all here and wonderful to share this great piece of work. As Meredith mentioned, we have been working for some time on this and um, I was asked today to talk about what is it? Um, so it is one amongst many guidelines um, that are available free to all of you as um, members of the Australian Packaging Covenant and some of these resources are also available to non-members. Um, this is work that we actually share with the community here in Australia, both, um, you know, industry and government, and it's to help people make the right um, decisions around various sustainable packaging alternatives. And um, this particular piece of work um, I am particularly proud of because we were, uh, the question I was asked to address was how was this created? And that gives me an opportunity to not necessarily talk to you about compostable plastic packaging, but to tell you about how it was created because it was created with what is one of the most important things about APCO, and that is our partnerships. Um, you know, there's three very, very important things at APCO that I, as a CEO of APCO, I'm very proud of. That's the team and the board that I get to work with. It's a very real impact our work has. But it's also, and thirdly, and most importantly, it's the partnerships that we build. We are very good at working well with others and we appreciate and understand the importance of this work and the very real and very true reality that um, no one individual organisation, government or individual can actually resolve all the issues that we um, have to address as part of the transition to the circular economy. And we've all got a really important role to play in that. And um, the only way you can do that is to work well with others, to leverage partnerships and build um, something like you're going to see today. So the compostable plastic packaging um, guideline was a collaborative piece of work with our priority partners, um, as Meredith introduced you to, both um, ABA and AORA. And I particularly want to um, call out uh, Rowan Williams, Warwick Hall and Pete Waterwitz. Um, they've not only worked with us on this particular piece of work, but have been deeply involved in our working groups, our events um, and our consultations over the last three, four years. And um, they bring a world leading level of technical knowledge and capability that we would be frankly quite lost without. So we are very grateful for their contribution, their commitment and the effort that they make. And also a little nod to our friends um, over in the UK in um, RAP. This particular format um, that you see with the decision tree process is actually derived from a wonderful piece of work that they did. We were we had already done our work um, through our working groups over the last two years to get to the understanding and having the analysis of the compostable space. Um, 
But uh, it, it looks like, uh, you know, our British cousins uh, beat us out a little bit in getting the format right this time because they put together a fantastic, um, you know, format which they very generously shared with us. And again, it's another example of, um, you know, great partnerships and leveraging resources and sharing, um, you know, creative pieces and, and really driving for that. So having given you that little um, roundup of where we're at, at and what the um, pack guidelines are about. It's all about compostable packaging. And, you know, the thing about compostable packaging is it's not right for everyone, for every circumstance, but there are some circumstances where it is the right solution. And this piece of work is really geared to helping you understand that. And so um, you're very fortunate to have both Rowan and Pete and then Lily join you and talk you through that. And then we'll have some questions at the end. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Rowan and um, he you can then walk you through um, the view from ABA. Thanks, Rowan. So thank you, Brooke, uh, Lily, and all the other APCO colleagues. I uh, appreciate your, your, your comments sincerely. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey, challenging at times, lots of consultants, lots of different points of view, but I think this is a, a wonderful body of work that we've managed to put together. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more work that goes into it along the road, but uh, it's one heck of a good start. So thank you for everyone's collaboration. Of course, I echo your comments to Peter as well without a aura pointing us in the direction of organics recycling and the how and the when, the where, the why. Uh, we wouldn't be any closer to this guide. So thanks a lot, Pete, and all the members of Aora. So uh, from my side, just a, a short uh, comment after that would be that uh, on behalf of all the ABA members, we've uh, really appreciated the opportunity to be involved and continue to be involved in the development of these guidelines for compostable packaging. For those that don't know the ABA, we are the peak industry body for the bioplastics industry in Australia and New Zealand. And we advocate for the appropriate use of bioplastics. Uh, Brooke touched on that, that they're not for everybody and they're not for every application. So we're here to help in guiding people for the appropriate use of bioplastics. Uh, and more importantly, the appropriate use of certified compostable bioplastics, which are suitable for organics recycling at the end of life. So the opportunity for compostable packaging to complement other compostable applications, such as the waste bags and garbage bags today we see in increasing FOGO collections. And generally where packaging is inappropriately disposed of or cannot be recycled because it is perhaps food soiled, then compostable packaging may present a significant opportunity in the diversion of this food waste or food soiled packaging from landfill. But this can only occur if the packaging is certified and compostable according to the requirements of the Australian standards. So in anticipation of the increased awareness of the need to be packaging to be recycled, reused, or perhaps composted through organics recycling, the ABA administers this program for compostable packaging to be verified to meet the requirements of Australian Standard 4736, which covers industrial or commercial compostability, and AS 5810, which covers home compostability. Each has different requirements. Uh, however, the ABA has for many years verified the claims of dozens of companies with products that meet the requirements of these standards. So once verified, this is carried in the guide as well, uh, once verified that a product meets the requirements of these exacting standards, the ABA can offer a license to use either the Loops seedling logo for industrial or commercial composting or the home composting logo, depending upon the intent of life for the package. So this is where we help you focus on design for end of life. So we're pleased to develop a joint position paper with Aora, endorsing the use of only Australian standard certified compostable products in the streams of Aora members, or where the certified compostable products will be diverted from landfill to organics recycling. So I wanna move on as well, because I'm very keen to get into the guidebook and everybody else. So if there are any more questions or more information required on the verification program or the activities of the ABA or its members or bioplastics more generally, please feel free to contact me at rowan.williams at bassf.com or via the ABA website. So once again, look, thanks very much for the opportunity to collaborate on this and over to you, Peter. Hi, everybody. I'll just let to go off mute. Um, thanks very much for that, Rowan and Brooke and um, all the team at APCO. It's been a fantastic experience working with all of you. Um, very, very educational, I can tell you. Um, so Aora is the compost industry. Um, we've got about 180 members. Uh, there's 65 processes and there's a lot more to join in the near future. We've got 13 sponsors. Um, we've got two research partners. We, we've partnered with the CRC for high performance soils and we've partnered with the, um, the Fight Food Waste uh, 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 CRC. 
um, to make sure that we've got the link between food waste and getting it back into agriculture. Um, and we've got one media partner to make sure that we're out there promoting as much as we can um, the good things. There's been a very, very confusing acceptance of the industry in terms of compostables. And I think that's mainly because of the lack of education of all of us in the industry. And I think that's partly where um, Rowan's team have actually come on board and helped us and worked with us and done workshops making sure that the industry actually understands what is compostable and that terrible, terrible word of biodegradable. Sorry, Pete, I'm just going to cut you off there for a second. Love. Your audio is just lagging quite a bit. I don't know if there's another um, setting or if you can fiddle with your headphones a little bit. Okay, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm in a really bad, I'm out in the country, so the service, because everybody's on Zoom and Wi-Fi and everything, it's pretty bad. I'll, I'll jump in for Pete, I think I can probably talk to uh, what we're going to say. Yeah. Okay, apologies everyone and apologies to Pete. Obviously, uh, we've got a, a little technical issue there. Um, so, Pete is really... Um, you know, um, talking on behalf of AOR and the most important thing that he wanted to speak about there was to follow on from what Rowan was saying about the importance of um, certified um, compostability, understanding where it's positioned within um, the, the value chain, um, you know, really being clear about the fact that um, compostable has to be also considered in the context of not only the packaging implications, but also um, the food waste issues that it's presenting as well, or resolving, I should say. Um, so that's an important consideration when you're looking at something like these compostable guidelines is it is about a, a systems impact and you need to, we really need to understand that you know, especially in the single use um, plastic space, some of the alternatives are also about um, food waste and, and how that connection is with packaging. And, and that's been a challenge that we've all got when we're talking about compostability, is that balance between um, the packaging um, and reducing packaging or packaging alternatives and their life cycle impact versus the actual food waste issue. I think one of the other things that um, is important that, um, you know, AORA and um, ABA and APCO have been talking Talking about is this guideline work that we have here is exactly that it's a guideline it's not all the work and all the solutions that need to happen for um, compostable um, APCO is working with ABA and AORA this year and, and other stakeholders on essentially a national discussion around what would be a national strategy for compostable. Um, you know, it is a, a somewhat niche solution um, for a small part of the market. And so we need to be clear about what it is that we actually want that to play out to be, how much volume of material from the packaging stream can actually go into that compostable. How does that work with um, you know, FOGO and other collection systems and, and how do we build that out and get that right structure. So there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Um, and what nobody is for a moment saying that today's guidelines are going to give you all those answers. There's another part of this work that needs to happen that will happen over this year and over the next 12 months around a conversation around the national strat strategic approach for compostable um, and how that works in all of those systems. So um, we would welcome you into APCO, into our working groups and into those um, that project and those conversations, especially those of you that have a particular interest in this space um, and see that compostable possible maybe an alternative for um, you know single use plastic food services as an example um, and so that's an important piece of work that we'll be continuing but having said all of that I will now let you get to the good bit um, and we will welcome Lily on to actually talk us um, through the guideline itself so I will hand over to Lily Barnett our program manager are you there Lily? I am thank you very much Brooke all right, I will jump straight into the guideline. Brooke has covered all of the uh, why and, and how. Um, so I'll show you um, yeah, a document that we are really proud of. Um, we've been working through it for a while now. Um, and we think that the interactiveness of the document um, is going to be hopefully really helpful for you all. Um, so I'll just get it up on the screen. Um, so it is an interactive document, so that's why as a part of this presentation we really wanted to show you how all of that works. So if we jump straight into it, um, our opening um, scene here is all about taking action. So 
Uh, this is a bit of a call to action document, um, as Brooke touched on. There's a lot of confusion in this area, so we do really want um, to make sure that this is a useful document. Um, it's something you can download or print off and use in your organisations. Um, as we all know, we all want to clean up our environment and minimise waste, but to do that, we really need to make sure we are using certified compostable packaging correctly. Um, and I think uh, that has just been really nicely reiterated um, by both ABA and AORA, and we'll touch on some of those challenges and why it really is so important a bit later um, in the document. Um, our quick call out there at the start there is just that uh, it's a common theme with APCO and we always try and reiterate um, that the waste hierarchy is very important. Um, so before jumping straight into compostable, we just flag that waste hierarchy in terms of reduction um, and reuse is always first on the agenda then we're moving into um, recycling and then composting um, further down the track. So just a helpful call out there um, before we get straight into it. So you can click up the top here to jump onto the next pages. Um, and this is our contents page where you can see all of the section that the guide covers. If you hover over the top, you should be able to see that you can actually click straight through into those sections. And likewise, you can across the top as well. So if you wanna jump um, to and from, um, that's a really uh, helpful feature here. So the whole guideline includes some really good clarification on what we classify as compostable plastic packaging, um, a lot of information on the terms, and as uh, Rowan mentioned before, the standards that are really important here. Then we jump into the landscape today, uh, which is all about our organics recycling system and the impacts that compostable packaging can have in those systems as well as if they do unfortunately end up in our uh, mechanical recycling system as well. Then we've got our key potential applications which we touch on, some important information about communication, and then our um, star of the show, our decision making trees. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got a really clear um, glossary as well. So I will jump straight into the first section. So this is our what is compostable plastic packaging? Um, and straight up, as you can see there, when we are calling an item compostable, we straight away identify um, that Australian standard, um, which we commonly refer to throughout the document as the Australian Industrial Composting Standard. The one that Rowan mentioned before, it is linked there, so you can jump straight in and find all that information. Uh, and then the other option there is the home compostability. So, that one's linked there as well, um, so that everyone can have a look at that. Um, and then if we keep moving along, we've got our clarifying complex terms. So this is a really important part of the guideline. There are lots of confusing terminology out there and something like um, certified compostable plastics can be very complex, as Rowan sort of touched on before. So Terms like biodegradable or bio-based um, can be really confusing. Um, so we try and highlight why uh, there are differences between all of these um, and really reiterate that uh, regardless of what the material is made of, um, that certification really is um, the pinnacle. That is what everyone should be looking for regardless of if it's bio-based or not. Um, those biodegradation features can really vary. So always reiterating um, that that uh, certification. And on that point, we have a whole page on that, um, which really shows, uh, as Rowan mentioned before, that seedling logo, which is for the industrial composting, as well as the home composting logo, which is there as well. Um, as Rowan mentioned, the Australasian Bioplastics Association um, help provide that verification um, and then they provide that certificate of conformance which is issued after a producer has followed the testing of the standard by an accredited laboratory. So that's a really important note here. The other important note that we've got on the page is down in that left hand corner there and that is uh, raising the issue that we do get a lot of questions on which is if um, my uh, compostable packaging is not plastic uh, do I still have to get it uh, certified? And yes, we uh, definitely encourage that and I believe the ABA does as well. Um, and so we do call that out there that they still need to be certified because there can be other additives or um, liners or anything along those lines. So 
we really want to make sure that we're not causing any toxicity concerns. So certification is always the best route there. And then we jump into today's landscape. Um, so this is all about uh, what are some of those challenges that the uh, current system is facing uh, because of where we are potentially at at the moment. Um, we call out that compostable packaging is a really small percentage of the market at the moment, um, which is why there has been a lot of confusion as well. Whereas with new products coming to the market, um, we need to make sure that they again are tested um, so that we can make sure that they don't cause any problems in the system. So thank you to Aora um, and to Peter and his team um, for a lot of this information. Uh, it was uh, very insightful for us as well. Um, and if we jump in, you will be able to see a bit more as to why. So there are a few challenges. Uh, as we all know, we have some limited collection, um, especially for consumers. Um, it's in terms of your FOGO or your food or garden organics collection. Um, so making sure that um, there, it, there's always several collections when we're talking about uh, away from home um, or closed loop systems or things like that. But when you're at home, it can be really hard. Some councils are lucky to have that. Um, so always just check with your council. Um, and then when we get into more complex areas, a lot of our current um, organics recycling systems aren't set up to uh, recognize or process that packaging. So again, some challenges to come through with that it's really hard for them to distinguish between a conventional plastic and a certified plastic as well. So more challenges we've just got to be aware of when we're jumping into these spaces. We then highlight here in a nice pretty diagram um, that whenever we talk about organics recycling, it isn't as straightforward as just composting. There's lots of different types of technologies. This is quite an advanced space. Um, so we really just need to make sure that we're aware of the type of packaging that we're using because it, uh, and the type of collection that you have, because that may uh, be affected depending on what type of actual organics recycling processing is happening at the other end. So a really important call out here to make sure that you're aware of that if you are looking into this. And we also just call out that if compostable plastics enter our conventional mechanical recycling stream, they are problematic because they do contaminate those other recyclable materials. So Another call out here just to make sure when we're looking at compostable um, plastics or packaging that they don't end up or make their way into that mechanical recycling stream um, so that that isn't confusing or causing any issues. Next up in the document, we have the potential applications. Um, now we've just highlighted a few here. Um, it's obviously individual to all different organizations uh, and depending on applications, um, but we have identified a couple that make sense to us um, based on several principles. Uh, food caddy liners are one that are already widely seen in the market. Um, so this is if you are lucky enough, as we said, to have a FOGO system at home, um, you may already have these bags. So they're a really lightweight um, soft plastic bag. They're generally bright green um, and they go into your food caddy liners. Um, and that helps with making sure consumers are uh, collecting those organics and putting them in their organic bin for collection. So that's a no-brainer there. It's a really helpful vehicle to make sure that we can collect and recover those organics to make sure they're not going to landfill. Uh, fruit and vegetable sticks are, stickers are another one that have come up locally and internationally. And that is, uh, again, down to the fact that if you've got a FOGO system and you're putting those fruit and vegetable skins into your um, composting or organics recycling collection, uh, we want to make sure that there aren't microplastics coming from stickers. We want to make sure that they're being processed properly like, um, like the rest of the organic. So that's a quick little call out. And the third one that we have there is our closed loop food service system. So this again is another um, call out in terms of where we've got a closed loop system and we've got a lot of control over the uh, collection as well as uh, the communication um, to the consumers that are there. This is a really big opportunity. Again, it comes back to that space where we want to be diverting um, organics away from landfill. So compostable plastics in these types of systems um, can be a really good vehicle for that. And then you can have great visibility over that collection at the other end. So 
another opportunity that we've identified. We then jump through into communication, calling out a couple of the challenges that we have there. And we have some statements that we recommend, uh, which are really clear um, and provide a lot more information for consumers. Whereas some of the statements that we have um, notified uh, that should be avoided are things like plastic free or 100% compostable or things like uh, biodegradable can be really confusing to consumers. Um, they are difficult to verify, they are very vague. Um, so we just call them out that if we are ever referring to compostable plastics, we make sure we notify the consumer that they are certified, um, that they're constantly looking for that and make sure we're telling them where to put it and how to dispose of that as well. Again, this is a really new area, so it's really important to provide as much information as possible to those consumers. So then if we jump into our decision-making trees, these, as I said, are the star of the show. Um, so I will um, jump in and show you how they work. Um, we quickly have a call out over here on the left bottom corner is that we do have our sustainable packaging guidelines link there. Um, and just make sure that you always jump in and use those first, as well as our quick start guide to recovery, which is also another publicly available resource for everyone to use when assessing their packaging. So if I jump into packaging and product manufacturers and brand owners, we jump into the decision making tree. Now the essence of it, of it is that you have a question at the top and you answer yes or no, depending on your specific uh, packaging or product application. So um, as we said, going back to that waste hierarchy, the first question we always ask, is the packaging or item necessary in the first place? Um, so if you were to say no, um, you'd probably stop there and we've got some advice in terms of actions as to what you could do next. But if we click yes, we have a little call out in between each of the questions. So this one's just to clarify that you make sure that you clicked on the right question. So is the packaging item necessary? Yes, yes, it's necessary packaging. So the next question we jump on to is, is the packaging item designed for single use? Yes or no, we keep jumping down. Is it, sing it is single use packaging. Next one, as we go back again to the waste hierarchy, can it be designed for reuse? Yes or no. Um, in some cases, people may not have thought of this before, so we really wanna make sure that we're calling that out. Um, and in a case like this, we wouldn't recommend a compostable plastic um, because there's a reuse opportunity right there. However, if we were to say no and we keep moving along, we can't design it for reuse. Uh, the next question is about making sure that if we were to go down a composting route, we would need to make sure that every component of that packaging was compostable. So if we've got different components in terms of a lid or a sleeve or something else like that, uh, we wanna make sure they can all go there together. So I'm gonna say no, I'm gonna say all of my components can be disposed of together. And then our next question is, does the packaging item contain food or is it designed to come in contact with food during its life? So we're gonna go yes or no. Now this one jumps us on to the next page, so don't be alarmed if it moves you down. Um, and this is the same question that was just on the one before. So do make sure um, that you don't get alarmed by this one, just keep moving on. So you've already answered, yes, it's in contact with food. So then we're gonna check if there is collection for mechanical recycling already available, yes or no. And that's gonna help um, understand if we should be again following that waste hierarchy. But no, there's no mechanical recycling available or conventional recycling available. Um, then we jump into understanding if it's rigid or not. So if we say, yes, we've got a potential application there and a little bit of guidance. Whereas if we go, no, it's a film. Um, again, we've got some guidance and some really clear actions there. So uh, an important one to follow. Now, the second one is our food service providers. Um, so again, similar questions. If we jump through yes or no, um, they're relatively straightforward again. Um, so I'll skip through this one a little bit. Um, this question here is all about if there is constantly going to be uh, or permanently be in contact with food, uh, which is a really important call out here. Again, when we're going back to the fact that this packaging can be our vehicle um, for recovering this material. So we've said yes, it's contaminated with food and then we're jumping on to understanding if it's a closed loop system or not. And we've helped provide some examples of what that could mean. 
And if we go, no, we do have still a potential application there because we want to make sure we're recovering that food. But if we go, yes, uh, we're also going into the closed loop system. Again, we're checking if something can be collected for washing or reuse or mechanical recycling. But if that's not available, we've got some opportunities there for, that are worth investigating. So um, some clear uh, guidance there. Then if we jump through, the final section of the document is a really clear glossary. There's a lot of terms in there. As we said, this can be quite confusing. So jump in there and have a read of all of those. And then another nice feature we have here is that we have the whole decision trees in a static place. Um, so that if you did want to print this guideline off, um, you can do that um, and then you can sort of have that on your desk or use it as you need. Um, and you actually can jump between the interactive versions um, or the full version as well. So that's a feature available if you, um, depending on what you would prefer. Uh, so I believe that is all. Fantastic. Thank you, Lily. Thank you for taking us through that. Um, I encourage everyone, I think the, the team have shared a link to that in the chat box. So I'd encourage you to all take a look on the APCO website and to download the guidelines and have a play around with yourself. So you can um, understand how to use those and, and click through some of those decision trees. They're really, really useful. All right. So I think now we'll head into group discussion. There have certainly been some great questions coming through on the chat box. Um, and thank you to all of our different speakers. Um, so we might go ahead and get started. Um, and this one's come up, it's a bit of a high level one, just on, so are these guidelines only for plastic compostable packaging? And um, what guidance is there on for labeling of non-plastic compostables? So this might be a um, peak question if you're back with us on the line. Yeah, it should be. Just sorry, read the question again for me, sorry. Okay, so are these guidelines only for plastic compostable packaging? And what guidance on labeling is there for non-plastic compostables? Yeah, well, what we want to try and do is get that label so that we can get it certified for all products, whether it's a, a gas um, certified product or a wood fiber, etc. so that we've actually got one label that clearly communicates so that we don't bring out another dozen labels. So that's, that's the intent. Rowan, can you support that? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, to be honest, but I'm happy to take it offline and give whatever information you want. But I agree, Pete, we want the seedling logo or the home composting logo on those products that are certified so. But I also see a question coming through from many different people is the concern over the volume of compostable packaging that's going to go pouring into these facilities. And I think we need to discuss uh, over the next 12 months, Brooke, how we communicate that the actual volume of compostable products is not going to be the torrent that everybody thinks for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, we need to provide, um, you know, for the appropriate facilities to handle what there is. So having the logo on those products that can be certified compostable is one hell of a good start. But I think this market will emerge in volume uh, you know, in the years ahead, but I don't think there will be the torrent that everybody thinks. So again, I'm happy to take the question and give an answer to everyone offline. And, and I think to add to that, Rowan, to add to that is the survey that Aurora has just done on the total potential tonnes that are available in Australia and all the states. Now we're going to do a drill down on each state and look at what the capabilities are short in each state, what lands required, what licensing is required, what capital is required, how many people are needed to be employed. So over the next couple of three years, we'll, we'll be adding that as this all, all improves and this whole communication area happens. So the industry is looking at that whole whole picture at the moment as well. Yeah, that's, and I think I would just add to that, um, to both uh, Pete and Rowan there, that um, let's be clear what compostable packaging um, is part of the solution and part of the work towards the 2025 um, national packaging targets. It is not a silver bullet. It is not the only answer. Um, there are many things and that is why we have a waste hierarchy. And, and as Lily went through that guideline, many times she referred back to the waste hierarchy and that is because there, you should, 
in terms of compostability, it is not your first choice. Um, you know, if you look at that waste hierarchy, it is about avoidance and reduction. So we need to reduce packaging as much as we can and avoid it where possible. Um, and then we then we move down into um, reuse and reuse is a higher order um, response and then you have recycling and then you have composting. So composting is a niche solution for a particular application. Um, it is not and will never be the, the silver bullets. Exactly. It will never be yep. the silver bullet and it will never it will not replace a massive amount of current packaging. So if you are talking or thinking about compostable packaging, before you do that, you should be thinking about three or four other things, i.e., do you need that packaging? Can you avoid it? Can you reduce it? Is it, is it um, suitable for a reuse system? Um, can it, is there um, a recyclability option? Then, um, if all of those are a no, then you start talking about compostability. So compostability is part of the solution, but it's not the silver bullet. And so you need to be very clear. And that's what these guidelines do. They give you that guidance to tell you what the preferred options are um, in regard to and in, in line with that waste hierarchy. And I think it's important to also note to Rowan's point about the volume of material. Currently, um, the, the report that APCO put out at the end of last year on consumption and resource recovery, there's 1,000 tonnes of um, compostable, certified compostable packaging being used in Australia right now. To give you some context, that's 1,000 tonnes of 5.5 million tonnes of packaging stream in Australia. So it's a very small volume. Um, it is still an important part of the solution, um, but it is for a particular application. Absolutely, Brooke. And I encourage everyone to take a look at the waste hierarchy and as you work through these guidelines and really use that as your starting place when you work through this. Um, another question probably here for Rowan and for those that might not be as familiar with the standards that are listening in here. And so some participants are interested to know if there are any plans for the two Australian standards to be updated. Um, and Rowan, it might be helpful if you can just call out the um, ecotoxicity and why the Australian standards are different than potentially the EU one. Okay, uh, different in the sense that both Australian standards are more stringent than the current European norms or the ASTM uh, or indeed any other standard on the planet, because they <clears throat> include an ecotoxicity or worm test, which was included in both standards at the time they were uh, published. Uh, at, we've had many inquiries over the years saying, why do we have it? We don't need to have it, blah, blah, blah. However, I can tell you that in the revisions of the European standards and the ASTM standards and others, the inclusion of a worm ecotoxicity test is being considered and is going to be adopted in some of those standards over time. So we actually were a little prescient uh, in having that as a protection for uh, compost that's going to be applied to agricultural land years ago. Uh, look, they're living documents. We regularly as an association uh, review the requirements of those documents with the requirements of say, how it lines up with the composting standard or what the organics recycling industry has to supply to their customers to make sure that what we're putting in their compost doesn't impact what they're then selling to their customers. So today they're currently as up to date as they can be and as representative of facilities as can be, but these things do change uh, and we will you know, routinely and regularly look at the standards to make sure that they're keeping pace with developments in the industry. Uh, there's no plans to revise them, but uh, I did see one question come through that the AS4736 came out in 2006, which it did but it was revised in 2009, granted that's still a while ago, but was revised in 2009 to pick up on some things that had been missed in 2006. If we find those same erratums or emissions or, or needs given now we're moving more into packaging as opposed to how they were originally designed, which was for flexible films, then we'll update them accordingly. We can guarantee you of that. Fantastic, Ron. I think that's really helpful. Um, other questions that are coming through, and I think something that's really helpful when we talk about that silver bullet solution and why it's great to have Pete on the line here is thinking about at the end of the day, um, once these, the compostable packaging goes through processing, it needs to go back and have a market. Um, so Pete, can you talk to us a little bit about what are the markets for composted materials? 
Oh, the, the markets are just huge. I mean, particularly in Australia where we've got such poor quality soils. Um, if you just use the, the mulch market in the vineyards in South Australia, we'd require 1.5 million cubic metres of material. That would be the next nearly 10 or 12 years. Um, uh, if we could get the organics out to the Riverland and, and Griffith and all those areas where, where vegetables grow, you know, the, the, the water saving potential, the carbon that we can build up in the soil is just massive. So the markets are just unbelievable. Um, so the size of the market can cope with all the compost that we can make for the next 100 years without a, without a problem. So I'm not, I'm not fearful of that at all. Great, Pete. And another one. I think that's an interesting um, part of the conversation that we have to have going forward. And I mentioned earlier on um, the additional piece of work that happens, you know, in um, alignment with these guidelines. The guidelines are, if you like, the starting point and um, that national conversation we need to have about the composting strategy and how it plays out in terms of recovery and distribution end markets, all those kind of things. Um, you know, Pete makes a good point. There's, there are plenty of end markets. Um, the work now is to be done is around, you know, how is that material collected? How is it recovered? Um, all those kind of things, keeping in mind that there are limited applications. You know, if you are talking about converting in packaging to compostable if it's if it's wet if it's moist if it's hot um, or any of those kind of things um, you can't use compostable for you're going to be challenged um, so you know we've got a, a limited um, application for compostable packaging um, but we do as Pete said have a great opportunity in terms of whatever is um, converted over to that stream will actually have a good um, solid home um, end market which is important so it's important that this conversation happens about how how we want the the um the compostable stream to play out in Australia in terms of how much material wants, um, we want to end up in that stream and what are, the, as to Pete's earlier point about the survey that they're working on right now with the AORA members, you know, what are the needs, what are the resources, what's the infrastructure, what's the capacity? So there is a lot of work to be done, done not only this year in having a conversation about what that could look like, um, but there's a lot of work to be done in building that and, um, and evolving and developing that work and that process as well. Absolutely, Brooke, thank you. Um, Pete, we have another question here for you as well. So with um, plastic composting, how do we mitigate against the risks of microplastics and how much data or evidence do we have to support this? Um, look, it's a really, really big concern of the whole industry and everybody, this microplastics. And so it's an area that we've just got um, the Crown um, group out of uh, Queensland to do a review of the standards of the world in terms of the compost standards. And of course that brings into um, those standards that Rowan was talking about earlier. So we are looking at this very, very seriously to make sure that we can address this. And I think um, with the banning of single use plastic and et cetera, et cetera, um, in South Australia, we met with the minister just re recently and we, we said we'd like to see a deposit put on everything, whether it's a piece of glass or plastic bags or anything because we get so much rubbish in the green organics as it is now. So any steps that we make like this conversation, like the Australian Packaging Covenants is talking about is absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, we won't do it tomorrow, but over the next one, two, three years, I think we can make such drastic changes in this space and it has to be done. So it's an area that we are really concerned about and as an industry, we're looking and trying to understand how we can fix it. We, we personally just spent a half a million dollars on more machinery to take any plastic out of our system that comes in. So again, it's, it's an area that we, I mean, Jeffrey's out the north of Adelaide just spent six or seven million dollars on making sure that their products are cleaner and cleaner. So we have to, we have to fix it. This is also Sorry, important. Sorry, go on, Ron. Make, make, make just one quick comment. You know, generally, uh, certified compostable plastics do not contribute to microplastics, full stop, end of story. Um, what you see with microplastics is confusion of these products labelled biodegradable, yes. which are probably yes. not certified compostable. And for example, in South Australia, you've got the plastic waste avoidance bill that was introduced to Parliament last Thursday to get rid of oxo-degradables, for example which is simply polyethylene with an additive, which certainly may contribute to microplastics if it goes through 
processes or loss to the environment. But the whole idea of the certification is it shows that 90% of the product, the package, the article is converted to CO2 within 180 days, but generally within four, six, eight weeks in a composting site. And then the disintegration of that material takes care of the balance. And there's many studies peer reviewed and others that shows that the 10% or whatever's left after the 90% is converted to carbon is fully assimilated by microorganisms leaving nothing but CO2 in small amounts, water and biomass. So this is the whole point of certification. If you're buying and using and labeling and getting certified compostable products to organics recycling, you are not contributing to microplastics in any way. Thank you, Rowan, excellent. That's yeah, and look, I would just reiterate what both Rowan and Pete have said there. And let's be honest about where the problem lies with microplastics. It's, um, it is in this space of, um, as Rowan said, the claims around biodegradability. And one of the really key reasons that APCO have um, done this piece of work and have given such clear guidance in this space um, through these guidelines is because it's really important that people understand um, if you are getting promised a silver bullet or a free lunch, there's no such thing. Um, and, you know, there is actually, um, you know, if you are going to buy packaging in this space and you're going to go down the compostable track and if you decide that's the right choice for you, make sure it is certified. There is a reason why certification is important. It's because that's how you actually make sure you get what you pay for. Um, and there are, to be frank, quite a lot of, um, you know, uh, organisations and greenwashing going on in this um, particular space. And so buyer beware, if you're getting promised um, a silver bullet or a, a, a simple solution, um, it's probably not what it is promising. So make sure that it's certified. Be, if you are uncertain or unsure about any of those kind of things, talk to ABA, talk to AORA, um, get the information, be sure that you get what you pay for. Um, because if you're being promised a simple solution, compostability is not a, a necessarily a simple solution and um, you know there's lots of promises and lots of greenwashing that's going on in this space and there are people that are doing really good work in here and it's time and it's very important and it's very timely that we actually delineate quite clearly between those who are doing this work well and appropriately and those who are not um, and that's clearly you can make that clear delineation by um, looking for certifiable um, compostable packaging. Exactly. Well said. Fantastic. Thank you, Brooke. Um, Lily, I have another question for you here. Um, so going back to the guidelines. Um, so when people are using the guidelines and there's mention of is the packaging considered single use? What is the definition for single use packaging in this context? Great question. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so hopefully uh, everyone would have seen that at the end of last year, APCO did release a uh, document that is referencing to uh, the phase out target, which is about problematic and unnecessary single use plastic packaging. Um, so the single use definition can be found within that document. Um, might get one of the girls to link it um, in the chat box so everyone can get access to that. Otherwise, we'll make sure we share it around afterwards as well. But uh, in, in terms of this context, we really want to think about it is, is it only being used by that consumer once and then they dispose of it in their bin straight away. Um, so uh, yeah, it can get complicated when we get in different areas, but take it back to that. Have a look at that definition and make sure you reference it, but take it back to those simplified steps of are they using it and throwing it in the bin after, especially when we're looking at things like food um, contact and things like that. Fantastic, thanks Lily. And just one more very practical question around the guidelines. So uh, when I download the, the guidelines and I open the link online, the decision tree isn't links aren't working for me. How can I fix this? So any advice on using um, this document? Yeah, definitely. So it really depends on what um, browser you are in when you're opening the document. Um, but for best results uh, with all the interactive functions, we do recommend um, that everyone downloads it. So do download that onto your desktop. Um, something like Adobe Reader is free to download if you don't have it already, um, but that is the best way to use the document. Um, likewise, as we said, we've got those uh, static decision trees at the end. Um, so if that functionality isn't working for you, um, feel free to jump straight to the end of the document and you've got that all in one place there. Likewise, you can print that off and use that as well. Great, thanks Lily. 
Hopefully everyone will be downloading these after the session is over. We have um, one more question, Rowan, this might be one for you. Um, so what's the consequence of compostable plastics ending up in landfill? If um, they become common, is it worse or better than non-compostable plastics in terms of LCAs? Uh, good question. Uh, I guess the simple answer is, you know, compostables are not designed to end up in an anaerobic environment. They're designed to get into an aerobic environment where biodegradation and microorganisms can do their work, i.e. composting or uh, you know, home composting. Uh, I think the issue is I've seen some questions go around to saying that compostables generate uh, emissions. And of course, there's probably some minor emissions from them. But if you've got one kilogram of organic waste in a compostable bag that goes to the landfill, Ultimately, it's the one kilogram of food waste that emits the methane, not the 10 gram of bag, although there will be 10 gram worth of the equivalent emissions of whatever in that anaerobic environment. So the, the impact is, I mean, a, a polyethylene bag that goes into a landfill is going to sit there for a very, very long time. Whereas over time, the compostable bag, for example, or article is going to biodegrade, but there will probably be some sort of methane um, what's the word, emission from that over, over a similar time. But ideally, it's a bit like the marine discussion. The idea is to avoid these things getting to that environment as best we can. Uh, and given that, you know, 80% of plastic pollution in the ocean comes from terrestrial sources, we'd be better off making sure that we stop these things at a terrestrial level before it enters that environment. Absolutely, and that was going to be the, the next question we asked you there, Rowan around plastics in the marine environment. All right. Yeah, look, there's a lot of, so just on the marine biodegradation and no one is suggesting that if we suddenly tomorrow have uh, a marine biodegradation standard that says plastic X is suitable to go into a marine environment because it will disappear overnight, no one's recommending that as a solution because ultimately that possibly could increase the amount of uh, material that's littered and just thrown away. But there is a large body of work going on, has been for the last three to five years, on research into biodegradability of many different polymers in a marine environment in both, I mean, marine environment means both salt and fresh water. Uh, that work's going on, and I understand that uh, you know, a marine biodegradation standard could be possible by the end of next year, but the, the studies need to be done so you have the science that underpins any particular standard. But clearly, what we want is to not introduce a reason to excuse people's stupidity and increase the amount of littering by telling them something's okay to throw down your sink because it'll dissolve. We, we don't think that's a smart approach at all. Absolutely. And I think that might be a good way to close and hand back to you, Brooke, um, thinking about the circular economy and um, why that's so important. And before we all head off as well, um, the team will be popping up a quick poll um, before anyone leaves the chat. If you can just fill that out before you leave, that would be fantastic. Um, Brooke, if you'd just like to say maybe a few words before we all head off, especially advice for any brands in terms of what's the best next steps that they should be taking. Absolutely. So um, once again, thank you to both Rowan and Pete for joining us and for Lily and her wonderful explanation of the uh, guidelines. Um, I hope that you all found it valuable. And I think in terms of compostable, what I would suggest to you is um, seek out, first of all, the sustainable packaging guidelines. Um, you know, the guidelines have 10 key principles in there in regard to sustainable packaging. And sustainable packaging is a conversation that is a lot broader than compostable. Compostable is one element and a smaller, the smaller of all the elements of sustainable packaging. Um, and then that will give you some great guidance um, they're available on the APCO website and um, we are happy to share them with you. If you get those 10 principles, you are well on your way to achieving um, sustainable packaging. On top of that, you know, if you do decide that um, you go through the guidelines and that compostable packaging is the best alternative for you. Um, do seek out the support of organisations like ABA and AORA who can give you the technical um, knowledge that you need to be able to make the right choices. And whatever you do, do not buy packaging that is not certified. And um, I was having a quick look at the chat there before and I noticed that somebody was somebody made a comment about, um, you know, uh, 
packaging coming in from overseas that, that claims to be compostable and what chemicals they are made of and how do we know? It's an excellent question and you don't know. So you are ultimately, as brand owners, um, liable and have an obligation to your consumers and you have to be able to defend the choices that you make as an organisation. Um, and if you don't know and you can't validate what it is that you're actually purchasing, then um, that's going to probably present you with some problems later on down the track. So be very clear and have a very very um, evidence-based approach to when you're doing this work and um, and look for things like the sustainable packaging guidelines like this compostable guideline document um, and make your decisions in relation to the waste hierarchy that is how you will make the most sustainable choices in regard to packaging here in Australia and other places so good luck with it all um, we are here and the team is here and Meredith's team is here to talk to you at any time if you want to have a chat um, you know the materiality of um, this space and packaging is really important and uh, Lily and her team are also here to talk with you so give us a call we're happy to have a chat and um, talk through these things and um, as I said if you want to get technical information around this space reach out to AOR and ABA they are wonderful people who will be happy to have a chat with you also fantastic thank you Brooke and thank you to our lovely speakers to Pete and Rowan and to Lily and if you have any questions directly with them pop them in the chat box or you can always send them directly through to AFCO at packagingcovenant.org.au and thank you all for coming. It is Thanks everybody. composting week as well, so go out and celebrate with your composting at home. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brooke. Thanks very much for everybody. Uh, thanks thank you. for setting this up. Thanks for all the APCO colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.